Good morning. I'm going to be a little more basic and uh, urge people to uh, concentrate on a few key issues that will not go away. In fact, will become more and more important as we go on, uh, not only in the uh, area of financial payments, but more broadly, living in a, in a digital world. Financial payments in the digital era are, as we all know and why you're here, uh, undergoing a fundamental change, in fact, better described as a disruption rather than a mere change. Yet at the same time, until certain crucial issues are not resolved, and as we become increasingly digital, we also face a dire future of insecurity, disruption of a different sort, a negative sort, perpetrated by bad actors, either to steal money or to bring down our banking sector or for political gain. The positive disruptive part is easy to describe. Cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, and perhaps more relevant for financial transfers, Ripple, and here in Canada, Jasper, are distributed ledger or blockchain-based systems which have garnered, as you have already heard, and you will hear undoubtedly all day, much attention, though they are still in their infancy for as conservative a sector as banking. Clearly, distributed ledger systems offer great, greater security for transfers and payments than legacy systems. At the same time, however, despite the excitement, the technology underlying bank transfers is not necessarily genuinely disruptive to banking if they continue to operate the way they do, charging large fees for cross-border transfers. After all, distributed ledger technology merely offers perhaps a better way to send money from one legacy bank to another. A far more disruptive technology is actually something very old, reimagined in the digital era. This is the use of the Islamic Hawala informal money transfer system by companies such as TransferWise. Hawala was used as early as the 8th century, even before the rise of Western-style banking in the 13th century in northern Italy. And it was used back when physically carrying money from one place to another was simply too dangerous. Pre-digitally, meaning before the digital era, Hawala was an informal and analog cross-border payment system based on the existence of a network of money brokers and this required a certain degree of honor and trust. The way it worked is you would, you would give the money that you wanted to be transferred elsewhere to a money broker. The broker would contact his colleague somewhere else in another country or simply far away, who would then give the money to the designated recipient based on a password. The actual money would never leave the country or where the original money broker resided. And this informal system has operated for 12 centuries. Only modern communications and now digital technology has speed, sped up transfer times considerably. Moreover, unlike the Hawala system, which has come under considerable pressure for m money laundering, especially since 9-11 in the US, digital transfers are all transparent. TransferWise and other companies that have followed its example have simply updated the Hawala banking system to the digital era. If you want to transfer money abroad, you deposit it in your own country in a TransferWise account, and the recipient in the other country receives the payment from another TransferWise account. There is no transfer of the kind that banks are used to and charge considerable amounts to do. While elementary in simplicity, this system has the potential to completely disrupt the current bank-to-bank -bank transfer system for at least the retail market, which may be a good thing since the charges taken by banks for what is, in any case, a simple transfer of electrons are rather exorbitant. I raise this just to show that old technologies, old concepts, um, can be updated in ways that maybe not, are not so gee whiz as, as, say, distributed ledgers. On the other hand, 
these old technologies, old ways of money transfer, re updated to take into account the possibilities of the digital era, can in fact alter the way banking and money transfers take place considerably. And I predict this ki these kinds of uh, these kinds of methods will increasingly be used in transferring money. Certainly. Um, companies like TransferWise and the ones that have since then cropped up and followed their example uh, are expanding at a huge rate. And I just read in the Financial Times today that these TransferWise is among the fastest growing companies in Europe. Um, when you think about international bank transfers, of course, uh, I mentioned also because TransferWise was originally Estonian. Uh, it was an Estonian, it's the second Estonian uh, uh, unicorn that was started by two guys who were working for the first Estonian unicorn, Skype. They were working in London and they found that the money they were making in the UK when they wanted to send it back home, they, they were losing so much of it that then they came upon this uh, method of updating the <coughs> Hawala system. Uh, since we live in an increasingly globalized world and money transfers are such a big part of it, cross-border money transfers are such a big part of it, certainly reducing the friction involved in transfers is, will be a major cost cutter. But I bring that more as an example of, of disruptive technologies that in fact are quite different from what everyone is talking about, blockchain. I would, ladies and gentlemen, caution uh, that we shouldn't be too blinded by the gee whiz side of new digital technologies and urge people to focus more on the proliferation of vulnerabilities that the digital era has introduced and will spend the rest of my time here talking about more fundamental issues uh, fundamental issues that are often forgotten or p given too little attention in the rush to implement new gee whiz solutions and that will vex financial transfers regardless of the technology used to actually make payments. And these are in fact core issues that we all face and not only in financial transfers but actually in any kind of data storage and in any kind of electronic or digital uh, transaction. In the digital era, whether we talk about financial transfers, dealing with government, dealing with the security of your own data, the security of your customer's data or privacy, two fundamental issues will need to be resolved or and constantly need to be resolved. One is identity and the other is data integrity. Basically, they're for pretty basic uh, fundamental questions. How do you know who is who and not someone else? And how do you know that your data are real and untampered with? In philosophy 101 terms, it's kind of like your undergraduate dorm, discussions of what is real and how do I know if something is real or not. As our lives, our transactions, our businesses become more and more based strictly or uniquely in the digital world, I, for example, did not visit a brick and mortar bank from 2006 until I moved in my country, until I moved to Estonia, and then in 2017, I had to go back to visiting brick and mortar banks. Um, but these issues will uh, cause more and more headaches as we move on in a world where less and less exists in any form other than digital. Some of you will no doubt find it paradoxical that we need to worry about who is who and whether what we have is real, um, whether we, that, is this really a problem? Since anyone who follows the news, and you already saw Cambridge Analytica up on the screen here, know that we live in an era where others, through social media interactions, 
our web searches and the various companies that mine these data sources for their immensely lucrative businesses can know more about you than even your parents, your siblings, your spouse, let alone your social media friends. They may know more about you than you know yourself about you. Uh, certainly these are some of the, some of the results of what uh, Cambridge Analytica did with its psychometric studies based on your Facebook likes. Yet either as individuals, as businesses, or financial institutions, we nonetheless inhabit a world where, to cite a famous New Yorker cartoon from already a quarter century ago, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. We ourselves know almost nothing about who we communicate with online, to whom we send our money over the internet, as individuals, as retail businesses, startup companies, we're subjected to all kinds of spear phishing attacks where ne'er-do-wells impersonate your bank, your payment system, your email account managers. In some cases, it is for stealing your data. In other, case, in other cases, as we saw last year with the Equifax hack in the United States, it is to steal the data that you hold on your customers. And much of this activity, not all, but very, a large part of it, comes down to inadequate verification of uh, people's or your interlocutor's identity. This is the question of who is who. For most transactions in the digital world, we still rely on a single password-based identification system that provided sufficient security in the 1980s when 3,000 academics around the world use a pre-internet form of email called BitNet. I don't know if anyone here recalls that. You have to be fairly old to recall that, but nonetheless, 35 years ago, that's how people communicated. But it was the same as today, your address and a password. Today, there are some four billion people on the internet and any simple password, no matter how long, how complex, how many letters you have, how many numbers and characters, any of these passwords can be brute force cracked depending on how great the bad guy's interest is in you. The solution minimally is to use a two-factor authentication system which considerably increases the security of identification and prevents the overwhelming majority of unwanted intrusions. To understand how great the consequences of not using a serious identity system can be, in 2015, 124 of the 126 employees of the uh, Democratic National Committee in the United States with access to their servers used two-factor authentication. Two did not. Guess how the Russians got in and what, was, what were the implications for the results of the U.S. election that the data or the emails of one candidate was published widely across the country. As a result, some, but not many, though slightly more aware companies, government agencies, and institutions do use two-factor authentication or have devised their own identity verification systems that require more than a simple password. These are usually based on some form of two-factor authentication of identity. That is, they require some additional form of verification in addition to a simple password. This eases the problem, but not satisfactorily. The problem with even these simple two-factor authentication systems is that they have tended to use as an additional authentication technology an SMS. And secondly, these are institution-specific, that is, they're not universally applicable. What works for one institution, one bank, won't work for another. What works for the government, uh, if you're fortunate enough enough to have a government uh, whose agencies do use two-factor authentication won't work for anything else. Um, 
More importantly, many systems, as I mentioned, use SMS-based authentication, which, alas, is fairly useless since the S7 protocol, or in other words, the protocol that governs um, mobile transmissions has been hacked a long time ago, and already last year a German Landesbank or regional bank lost 3 million euros uh, in a hack with uh, two, using two-factor authentication over SMS. So in addition, genuine security requires um, basically a chip or token-based end-to-end encrypted verification system, meaning authentication must be done so that no one can steal your verification or spoof it. In my own country, we figured this out about 20 years ago. Uh, since we had a vision of digitizing governance, uh, which was fortunately shared by our banks with whom we partnered and devised a single identity based on two-factor authentication and end-to-end -end encryption using PKI or a public key infrastructure for any digital transaction between the individual and the government or his financial institution. The same is, <clears throat> we use the same for each and every agency to agency or bank to agency communication. Your identity in this system must be authenticated by a certification system jointly operated by the government and a consortium of banks. In the 17 years since its implementation, the system has been upgraded, the level of encryption has been upgraded, but it has not once been breached and continues today without any breaches. Meanwhile, 98% of financial transfers in my country are done digitally, and uh, more importantly, no one knows what a check is, and when my younger compatriots come to the United States, they are aghast to find out they have to write checks. We also solve the issue of applicability, as this chip-based identity was used for all transactions with the government and was the preferred system for banks, uh, and then other private sector companies adopted this as well. It is universal and ubiquitous. All residents have a chip ID or uh, the, using the SIM card, which is also a chip, obviously, in their mobile phone. And so the government bank consortium partnership can devote much gr far greater resources to guaranteeing the security of its systems because it is basically the, the secure basis of security for most transactions in the country. Uh, and so today is the unif universal form of identity from everything uh, from purchasing movie tickets to prescriptions to how you do your taxes. Uh, in fact, there are only three transactions in my country that you cannot do online. Uh, that is getting married, uh, that is getting divorced, uh, where you also have to show up, may not be so nice always. And uh, finally, for, physical, for transfer of physical or property or real property, which I guess, again, because of what we see in the news today, you can't have a shell company buying property in my country, which may come out of our location, but certainly it's a lesson that maybe some other countries might adopt as well, specifically the UK and the United States, but I won't get into that. Um, if you want to read more about all of this, uh, last December's New Yorker had a long, long, typically wonderful New Yorker article on this. If you Google the New Yorker and the Digital Republic, you'll get this long article that describes how all this works. Security of communication, however, is not enough. Today, ever since uh, Edward Snowden's revelations, and even more so now as we read about Facebook selling your data, Russians hacking Hillary Clinton's emails, or Cambridge Analytica creating a highly granular targeted political uh, advertising scheme, we've become obsessed with privacy, and rightfully so. Yet we forget that privacy or confidentiality is a higher virtue. The integrity of data is a far more basic concern, especially when we are dealing with other people's money. I may be annoyed if someone publishes my blood type, my, an unflattering mail I've written about a colleague, or someone finds the dismal state of my bank account. But if someone changes the record of my blood type, it can be fatal. 
If someone alters an email I've written or my, the contents of my bank account, I can be ruined reputationally or financially. This is why data integrity is the other core issue that needs to be resolved at virtually all levels of data storage. It is not merely an issue of bank transfers, though I see that you know, Bitcoin or other blockchain is the hot item for transfers, but it is an issue for all money matters. The best solution to this fundamental problem to date has been to store data on a distributed ledger. This is what's also known as blockchain. Um, I try to avoid the term blockchain because it's become the sexiest term since uh, dot com 20 years ago, and sometimes I fear it will meet the same fate. While I spoke earlier about distributed ledger systems and financial transfer technology, such as Ripple or Project Jasper, it is a far more fundamental concern, not just financial transfers, not even for financial records, bank accounts, but all records in general. We are becoming digital. All records are going digital. In my country, we have a series of uh, whole, whole areas where there are no records that are, not that are in analog form from our birth certificates to court proceedings to property records. Uh, and since they exist on, all exist on digital form, we realized that we had to put this on a digital uh, a distributed uh, ledger because what if someone came and changed something, changed birth certificates, changed property records? Uh, so I would ask people to think much more broadly. When you hear the term blockchain, don't think of it sectorally. Think of it as a fundamental issue. It's some, a fundamental issue for financial institutions and not just transfers. In my own country, uh, living in a bad neighborhood with a millennium of bad experiences, we've been invaded on an average of about once every 50 years in the last thousand years. Um, we're perhaps more worried about data integrity issues than others. Um, yet for all of the benefits of this borderless digital world that we live in, we must realize that security has also become borderless. Our financial data can be stolen or altered from across the globe. There are plenty of those who would do so for financial or, in fact, for political gain, for disrupting our financial systems. And it behooves us all, especially those who are most vulnerable and most appealing, the financial sector, to vote far more attention to the disruptive threats and potential catastrophes and not just look at the gee whiz possibilities of the digital era. Since I'm convinced that as the opportunities grow, we should not be blinded by them. We should also constantly think about the vulnerabilities, the enhanced vulnerabilities that, that are created and that are made possible as we rush headlong into all of the wonderful possibilities that you will describe here. Never forget security. Maybe it's because I was, you have to deal with these things. I had to deal with these things in office, but every step toward the future, uh, the bright future, must take into account what is potentially dark. Thank you very much. Thank you.